this is a uh, kind of a field experiment, which is not normally what, what I've done in the past, but with my wonderful co-author, previous PhD student now, uh, not just co-author but also colleague uh, Graham Pierce, um, I can say that this is uh, a stream of field experiments that have, we have been working on and this is the very first one in that which basically looks at other regarding preferences in a what we call a real market and I'll tell you a little bit of how, how we got to choose the market. Um, and the reason why we conducted this study was that um, if you follow the uh, literature then uh, in some sense uh, there are some voices recently, many few years back, that say, well, uh, all these laboratory experiments, they're great, uh, but to some extent, um, it's not, I'm not saying they're questioning necessarily the external validity, but they tend to say, well, maybe what you find in the lab is a little bit exaggerated. And it's a little bit exaggerated in the sense that um, they are um, endogenously selected, so you've got your student population, they know that they're participating in the experiment, there is experimental demands that are following up, there is um, particular self-selection, etc. And we can name a lot of the criticism that people uh, try and use when they want to shoot our papers down in journals or when they uh, say that, oh, where's your external validity? But um, in some sense, we, we have to listen to them a little bit to see what, why, why are these uh, critics out there. And um, Basically, if you look at the literature on other regarding preferences, despite the very large amount that you find uh, on lab studies, there isn't all that much when it comes to what we say markets. And I'd, I'd like to think of it as a little bit in quotation marks. Yes, first question. There you go. So, sorry, you might want to explain what we mean by ah, other regarding preferences. Thank you. Preferences. Yes, I'll do. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so when I, when I say, when I use the terminology of other regarding preferences, I basically think of a world where our utility is not just defined about our own payoff. It is defined potentially about other people's payoff, potentially about the relationship of that payoff to our payoffs, uh, and so forth. So apologies for that. Yes. And um, when I say that uh, when I say markets, now a lot of you will think, well, but there's a lot of evidence on charitable giving, and that's real world, and that's true. But when I say market, I really mean the kind of service, uh, price service that you buy something and you get something in return, which people might think, well, you buy a certain uh, goodwill you give to charity, but I'd like to think of the charitable market as, as a little bit outside, and I'd like to focus on a, an exchange market where you exchange goods and services for money, okay? And there isn't all that much when it comes to the literature there. Now, uh, one reason why uh, probably uh, there it's very difficult to pin down this does somebody really care about somebody else in, in the real world, is that in the real world, oftentimes, reputation is very difficult to disentangle. So if you go into the shop and uh, somebody treats you nicely, uh, you might think about, well, uh, maybe the shopkeeper is thinking of you as a prospective future customer. So it's not just this one-off interaction that he or she is having with you. And uh, so reputation might be a big thing where behavior in a market might look as if people have these other regarding preferences, but uh, they um, might actually only be concerned about their future interactions. Okay, and clearly uh, a big proponent uh, behind this is John List, who has done excellent and wonderful work uh, and showed that there's a lot of reputational concerns out there. Now, the other thing clearly is there are uh, monitoring concerns, okay, and uh, in terms of how do you actually um, uh, look at and, and monitor what's going on in the market. Now, the other catch is for those of you who are a bit more uh, theoretically inclined, and that's absolutely fine, I'm not saying that everybody has to do experiments, but if, even if you come up with a theoretical model in which you model the agents to have these kind of preferences that take into account other people's payoffs, other people's utility, uh, you might come up with a model that does this, and then the predictions are such that actually these agents behave in the end, they look very much like selfish agents. So even the theory where you put all this in, the outcome might be very indistinguishable from what you would get if they were purely selfish. So therefore, it might be very difficult to pin these things down and we'd actually like to um, collect some more data and see how can we actually uh, get at this from what we will conduct, a field experiment. And I'll tell you a little bit more about potentially difference between field and lab for those of you who are not quite familiar with that. 
Now, the other motivation of our study comes in that on top of, so the realization that maybe people have these other regarding preferences, okay, uh, the other thing is that uh, we have, again, quite a bit of lab evidence uh, these days that people tend to condition their behavior depending on with whom they're interacting. Okay? And when we say that, we mean that um, basically, uh, potentially, we can see group biases uh, popping up. Okay? And there's one uh, uh, early st or an earlier study in the uh, published in the AER by, by Chen and Lee, that basically looks at these um, social, pre social preferences. And social preferences you can think of as, a, as a, even a broader terminology uh, of not just other regarding, other regarding is part of it. Okay? Uh, it shows that they are group contingent, that people actually, depending on what group they're interacting, they might be more or less um, thinking about the other group's welfare or only be selfish. Okay? Now, if you think along these terms, you're very quickly in the world of Gary Becker. When Gary Becker thought of his, uh, in his book, or The Economics of Discrimination, basically the concept of taste-based disc uh, discrimination. Now, some of you might be working on discrimination, and you all know that there is this big debate about, is it taste-based, is it statistical? Okay? And uh, we'll, I would say we'll kind of scratch at it a little bit in this paper. We can't, we, I, um, I'll tell you uh, at times when we try and get at it, uh, more or less, but the whole thing, when you're thinking about putting it into a utility formation, what do you really do? You think you, uh, the preferences are group contingent, it means that you might potentially behave differently depending on with whom you're interacting. Now, that can be taste-based, of course, the whole thing is why it's so difficult to pin down taste-based is, as we as economists and uh, probably the psychologists are bought over already, we always, we bring in beliefs in the end, right? And we try and justify a lot of things with beliefs, right? And then we try and say, no, it's not taste-based, it's statistical because we have certain beliefs about this um, subgroup that we are treating potentially differently. But again, it's a little bit outside. Now, there's a little bit of support in the field, but not all that much because of this differentiation and you can't quite make out whether it's taste-based or statistical. <coughs> um, and there's one uh, particular study that you might be familiar Sorry, with. Uh, it's taste-based and statistical, what's the difference? Ah, so say if I, um, if I treat you differently because you um, have glasses. I have glasses, so we feel a certain uh, intimacy uh, in, but amongst the glass wearers. And um, that might be just perfectly taste-based, right? Yeah. But now I, we can also bring this around saying that I think people with glasses, apologies to the ones that are not wearing glasses, uh, people with glasses are more intelligent. And uh, so therefore I'm treating you differently and uh, that is a belief I'm holding about that group and, and that's the way. So if I treat somebody like a very bulky looking male in the street uh, a little bit um, potentially with more respect, but just because I'm afraid. I'm thinking that this person is more aggressive. So anybody who, who, f who falls into that category, I have beliefs about them being more aggressive. I might treat them differently. Or I might, as an employer, it's often in the employment contract, or people have done studies in terms of um, rental housing. So you might, your tenants, you might not want certain tenants. Or discriminate, treat, it's always, I want to be careful, treat different tenants from different ethnicities differently or different genders because you believe they might behave differently once, once they're in your rental property. Okay? And that might be because you actually don't like them. That's the taste-based kind. Or you have beliefs about their behavior that might you say, no, I need a bigger deposit. I might need to charge them more because I have to repair my flat after they move out. Those kind of things. Okay? Sorry for um, So the Bertrand Molinathan study is... Um, and why it's, uh, it, it's a correspondence study where they send out these CVs, they manufacture them, uh, they're made up, but they're identical in the sense that they either have, say, an American, uh, African-American sounding name or they have an American, white American sounding name. They send them out and they basically are interested in the callback rate from employers. And they find that um, clearly American sounding, white American sounding names are more employable, they get more callbacks. Okay? I'll come back to the Mujik and Fridges study in a second uh, when I talk about ours. Now, um, again, these studies that are, apart from the field ones that are done in the lab, again, the usual criticism applies. So what's the external validity, self-selection, same thing. And um, basically what we want to do is we want to look at, um, we want to go out in the field, so we want to look at a market 
uh, and see to what extent are people actually exhibiting what we call other regarding preferences. Okay? And remember, we are economists, we can't help it. Uh, and so we're looking at a situation where this behavior is costly. So I do something to a stranger without thinking about future interactions, just here, now and then, and I do something that's costly to me that benefits this other person. That's what we are after. Okay? And then um, we try and see whether there is a, uh, that behavior uh, is potentially, or depends potentially on the ethnicity of the person with whom we're interacting. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, I'm actually ahead of myself. And the second one was, we, we want to make sure, I want to convince you that the reason why we observe this other regarding behavior is not because of reputation. Okay? So that's what we do. But before I tell you now, I'm just checking the time. So it clearly there's lots of, um, uh, lots of literature there. I'm not going to spend uh, too much time. I just want to uh, point out a few. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll skip those because I think it's more interesting to, to look at what we actually do So um, in terms of time. And um, the, uh, when it comes to these kind of field studies, uh, I want to point out, they're usually, uh, when, when you look at these discrimination studies in particular, um, they are either done as correspondence studies or audit studies. Now the difference is, uh, when you look at correspondence studies, so this was the Bertrand Moulinathan study where you would kind of manufacture CVs, for example, send them out and see what the response is. You could conduct an audit study if you're interested in doing this kind of work, and that's what uh, basically John List and a lot of other people have done in terms of sending actually uh, pairs of uh, individuals, and they might you might want to call them testers, you might want to call them confederates in psychology or, or any other terminology, actors, and send them in to say a lot of work has been done on car dealerships. So who gets quoted a uh, bigger kind of uh, starting price on a used car, is it a man or is it a woman, okay? And um, then uh, you send in a man and a woman to the same car dealership and see what prices they are quoted. Uh, and that's what's been done. Now what we are doing is an audit study, so I'll tell you a little bit about these audit studies. And um, the, the idea is that the, uh, you believe that basically um, you try and see the exact same interaction with this paired, pair um, kind of uh, actors, and any kind of differential treatment is usually referred to as um, discrimination. Now, what's a little bit of an issue often there is that, well, if you've ever looked at a man and a woman, they might potentially differ by other dimensions, just by being men and a woman, okay? Said and I, uh, he doesn't wear glasses, for example many other things potentially different between us other than him being a man and me being a woman. That's often not so much uh, looked at. And, um, but whenever there is a dis uh, basically um, these pairs are sent in, it's assumed that they only differ in one dimension. Okay? And uh, now, here's what we do, because I think I'll, now I slow down a bit uh, and tell you what we have. Uh, I know, I mean, some people are even from England, uh, so we'll actually go to Manchester uh, and uh, we'll uh, conduct a, um, a study where our, so this is a field experiment. For those of you who are not familiar with field experiments, the difference to, one of the differences to lab experiments is that the subjects that you are, whose data you are collecting, are not aware of them being participating in an experiment. So this one thing of self-selection into the pool, we can negate that criticism. Um, the other thing is clearly, and that's often why John List is a very big promoter of these field experiments, is that we are observing them in their natural environment. Okay, So they don't know that they're participating. It's not artificially uh, kind of uh, set up as a market. It's what they do on a daily basis. And that's where we observe. So we look at these uh, British caps, and um, I have to say, lots of credit to Graham, clearly. Um, he's done the majority of the work. Uh, I couldn't possibly have done this uh, w without him, and um, many of the things even at all. So we're looking at these, Hegne they're called Hegne carriages, and these are these black caps. They're different from the private hire vehicles, and the, the reason how they differ is that, um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit uh, um, about it. So this is a typical taxi rank, or a taxi, I don't know what you, would you call it a taxi rank here? 
Um, well, actually, I think this is, is it Victoria Station? I'm not quite yeah. sure. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so the, um, and so that's, uh, what, what are these taxi drivers? Well, they're all very well trained. Um, some of you might be familiar with these studies of fMRI, studies of London cab drivers, that their brains are actually even very different by the time they finish their testing and memorizing everything. But so these are, uh, these are they're very well trained and they're licensed. Um, the difference between these Hegne carriages and these private hire vehicles is that you can only call a cab or you can get a cab at this taxi rank. Uh, or you can flag them down on the street. You can't really call them unless you have the number. Okay? These private hire vehicles, they cannot use the taxi ranks. And the private hire vehicles, you can't just call them. If you, if you see somebody cruising the streets, you can't flag them down. They're not allowed to pick any passenger up from the street. They can only pick up passengers for prearranged rides. Okay? That's the difference. Um, and um, if you've ever tried at a taxi rank to say, no, I don't like this particular taxi driver, I'll take the one next door, it's, or the, the one that next in line, it doesn't quite work. So you basically get the taxi driver that's up there at that time when you show up there. Um, so in and of itself, there isn't all that much of a repeated interaction going on. That's what we already believe, but I'll show you in a second how we manipulate that and make sure that it's really not, not happening. Um, what, uh, in general, um, we know from taxi surveys that the majority of journeys actually start from a rank, at least in Britain. Um, the taxis are metered, like what you would have uh, here uh, in, in Perth as well, and it depends either on the distance or on the time that you spend in the cab, depending on the traffic, <coughs> clearly. And I'll show you a little bit more about how much that is. Uh, what I've learned now through the study is also that um, actually the meter is the maximum price you are asked, you can be asked to pay. Apparently, and uh, not very many know, people know that, and we verify that with questioners later, before you enter the cab, even in England, you can actually negotiate. You could stand outside the cab and say, take me there and I'll have this and this much money, can you take me there? But we um, have later follow-up surveys with the uh, taxi drivers. The taxi driver, we ask them, so how often does it happen that somebody bargains? Hardly ever. And uh, we do ask them then, would you actually uh, reduce your price? Uh, and they would say, yes, we, we would, right? So, but, but nobody really ever does it. So once you're, and it's, it's kind of uh, for our study, so once you're in the cab, you pay the fee. And there aren't many instances. We look at a, um, also the, the crime reports of Manchester. We do Manchester and Birmingham. And how often does it happen that a passenger doesn't pay the, f the fare? It doesn't happen very often. At least it's not reported. Um, what's very important for our setting is that all these cabs, <laughs> they're actually privately owned. So they might be affiliated with a taxi company, but these taxi drivers own their cab and they basically keep their uh, rewards and they pay all their costs, okay? And that's important. Remember, we are after behavior that's potentially costly for somebody because if I would show you that somebody does something nice or not so nice, but it's entirely not costly, then you may think, well, Bert, that's interesting, but what do we really learn from it, um, in particular in terms of economics, right? So here's just a, a little bit of an idea of what it costs. So the initial charge, they are actually, I think in England, taxes are cheaper probably than, than here, uh, if I take that from a casual observation. Uh, so basically it started about 220 and then they go up. Um, so that's just, and these are the two areas we look at. We didn't go to London for the reason that we um, didn't want to get stuck in traffic and for the amounts that I'll talk about, we wouldn't have gotten very far. And so that's why we went out of the city and looked at the second city, which is Birmingham and Manchester as whatever city you might want to call that. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give you a little bit of the market idea is that there are lots of taxis out there. So it's a very thick market, I think. And um, in terms of Birmingham, what's interesting is that roughly, so we go to the greater Manchester area. I think I might, ah, no, I shouldn't, shouldn't cover that. Uh, so the sum roughly the same, Birmingham, the Greater Manchester area. What's interesting is that there are slightly more, seemingly many more, uh, taxi ranks in Manchester. I don't know why that is. It doesn't seem to, when we later, when I show you the result, that doesn't seem to be anything behind that. 
Again, the, the, the busiest taxi ranks, these are weekly passenger numbers. These are quite large numbers, I would say, for these, for these taxi uh, drivers. So there's a lot of action that's going on there. So what do we do? Well, I told you this is an audit study. So we do uh, take uh, testers, confederates, actors, but not Hollywood or Bollywood actors, but just uh, we recruit people for research purposes. And here's the catch. Uh, when you do field experiments and you try and go through IRB or ethics approval, uh, some universities are more hesitant than others. So basically our restriction was that we cannot screen our, uh, our testers on any kind of category. So we couldn't say that we'd like this many of a certain ethnicity and this many of the others. Once we're advertising and we get a response, anybody who fulfills the criteria, we have to employ. So unfortunately, that limits us in the sense that um, we are not quite uh, able to go after certain ethnicities as we wanted, but we have a pool that we have to work with, okay? Just as a little bit of warning. Um, so we ask, and I'll show you, the next slide tells you exactly what we do, in terms of um, we design 120 unique journeys uh, before the experiment. We've got about, uh, we basically, every journey started at a taxi rank, and we went with uh, Google Maps and looked at, okay, where can I, ta where can I go from, say, taxi rank A? And so we went to a destination, say, B, and that destination, we looked at, uh, our criteria was it should have been roughly cost you about five pounds when in our short distance treatment, I should tell you that in a second, and uh, roughly 10 pounds in the long distance treatment, okay? We wanted to avoid any kind of rough areas, um, so only kind of safe spots. We only do this during the daytime, but we come up with basically a tester. If you were a tester or a confederate in our study, what you would have needed to do is go to taxi rank A, and you knew your destination, you'd go into the cab, take the cab there, and then you would need to walk up to, and this was <coughs> announced that we couldn't put a potentially deal with people in wheelchairs, which is a totally different study, clearly. Uh, so we said it would involve walking. So once you get off the cab, you walk to another uh, taxi rank that we tell <coughs> you to. It could take up to 15 minutes, and then you take another journey to another destination, and so on. So you do many of these during a day as a tester. Um, and here, so we've got a two by two design in which we vary whether it's a short distance, five pounds, or a long distance, 10 pounds. And um, just to make sure, the, given that the rides are a bit cheaper, there's actually quite some distance. So it's about 1.7 miles versus 4.4 miles. So that's, that's it's quite some, some distance that you could cover, cover with that journey. Um, and then, um, What's interesting is that uh, our, we, I told you already about the post-experimental questionnaire with these taxi drivers, and we find that uh, if we ask, so we ask them many other questions, and I'll trickle them into the talk as, as they are relevant, but uh, basically we ask them, so how much do you think does it cost to go from taxi rank so-and-so to this destination? And the taxi drivers are amazing. They can tell you pretty spot on how much it is. Um, now, here comes our um, basic reputation check. Now, in this setting, we believe this is already very much a one-shot setting, right? But we wanted to yet kind of uh, layer it with a uh, treatment where we potentially induce reputation to, be, to have an effect. And we do that by asking the driver for a business card, okay? And I'll show you the precise wording on the next slide. Now. All, we try to keep it as simple as possible to avoid any kind of uh, biases that might come in. And here's what we do. So if you were a tester in our study, you would basically show up at the taxi rank and uh, Graham, every day, he observed he was there for the very first ride our testers took. And um, the tester would go to the taxi driver and state the destination and get into the taxi. And then in the baseline treatment, they would say, I don't take taxis very often. Now you might, all different kinds, uh, you might think, well, what else? You could have said something else that you're not from city or whatever. Yes, we could have done that. The reason why we wanted to say something is that in the other treatment, we also say something. So we didn't just want to compare treatment where you don't say something with something you say something. 
So it may not be the most perfect thing that we could have said. It might be very artificial. We are back to the lab environment where things are artificial, but um, we wanted to keep it simple and we wanted to make sure that it really signals a one-shot interaction, okay? Which the very nature of these taxi markets are, but, but that's what we do. Now in the business car treatment, our tester says basically, I'm looking for a reliable driver for future journeys. Can I have a business card? Again, you might think, how weird is that to ask at the beginning of the journey for a business card? Yes, points all taken, but again, for comparability, we wanted to make that clear at the beginning because that's also when you want them to think about potential future interaction. Yes, Saeed. So when do they say they start baseline treatment? Like I don't take it's at the beginning of the journey? Or? Yes, everything is. So they, this, is tea, this is really pretty much the beginning of the journey. They state the destination, and they, they enter the taxi, and in the control, they or control, in the baseline treatment, they say, we used to call it control, now it's baseline. Yeah. I don't take taxis very often. In the business car treatment that we used to call reputation, now we call it business car, I'm looking for a lever driver. So it's very much the moment they get into the cab, after they've said where they wanted to go. But they would not know that whether it's a reliable driver or not until they have taken the journey. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, but it might potentially signal that this is not a one-shot interaction. Okay? <coughs> then, at time T2, whatever, it when basically when the taxi meter reaches 60% of the expected fare. That means that basically at um, three pounds for the short journeys and at six pounds for the long journeys, the tester says, oh, I'm sorry, I do not have, I only have four pounds in the short one. In the long one, I only have eight pounds. Can you still take me to my destination for that amount? This is before the meter reaches that amount. At this time, this is not a post-agreement negotiation. This is ex-ante. This is still the driver has ample time to kind of think about should he accept or she accept. Um, but uh, basically, before it reaches the amount they can afford, do you want to take them longer as the driver or not? And basically, uh, it's kind of mirrors. It's, it's not necessarily an ultimatum in that sense. So it gives them a little bit more time. It gives them time to think about where to stop because sometimes you can't just stop anywhere, um, although English people tend to sometimes stop just anywhere on the road without thinking about what's behind, but uh, they uh, basically, now you might think, why 60%? Think of it, the, the journey starts at about £2.20, £2.30, so we could have done it at 55 at 65 this isn't a, a science figure, it was just somewhere we wanted to give them some time, so it's a one pound time in some sense in the short journeys and it's two pounds worth of time in the long journeys that the driver has to think about the request. Okay? So that's, that's what we do basically. And then driver, whenever the driver stops the taxi, our tester gets out. This might be at the final destination. It might be at the very mo first moment they mention that they don't have enough money. But basically we are interested in where is that? Okay? In relationship to clearly how much they can afford, okay? And when we look at now other regarding behavior, we ask basically um, how much longer is a person taken depending on how much they can afford, okay? And that's what we call giving, okay? So uh, our testers um, had to do a bunch of things. They also kind of took some notes on the driver. Basically, we're interested in race, age, which is all subjective. Uh, gender, um, whether it was busy road, whether it was raining, um, we had actually um, anticipated that the driver, when somebody tells you, oh, I don't have enough cash, they would say, oh, I'll take you to an ATM, right? And so we had frequently asked questions and answers for our testers and say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have my bank card with me, was the response they were supposed to give. <laughs> and um, so they had to also stick whether the driver had... Uh, um, started a conversation or wanted to have a conversation because that's a whole different interaction then and we instructed everybody to not talk to the driver. It might be awkward again because if you ever have a talkative driver and you sit there like a stick and don't do anything, they also, it, it creates certain animosities. But we didn't want to get into this whole um, how familiar you're getting with the driver. So basically they had to record the final meter reading. That was the data then that we are uh, getting. 
Now our testers, uh, we had, again, this is now pretty much constrained with what we got. We um, posted this on a job uh, search site in Birmingham and Manchester. And what we got were basically 22 testers that responded to, to our adverts. And they all attended training sessions. We um, basically took their photo. We t got all the age, gender, race, uh, levels of education. And why we took their photo was because we actually uh, wanted to get a little bit potentially behind this, um, the discrimination part, individual characteristics. So if somebody might be uh, looking as if they're very aggressive, right? Maybe you give in earlier. We were basically rating them um, through other student populations uh, or student uh, raters for their trustworthiness. Think of, well, is it really the truth that this person was telling me that they only have that much money? We were interested in friendliness. Maybe if you're friendly, you get away with more things. Attractiveness. We know there are studies that show that there are certain effects of attractiveness. Aggressiveness, as I already said, and worldliness. Okay? And we later put all of these into the regressions to see whether they are potentially are predictors of, uh, of how much they are being taken longer or shorter. Clearly, we didn't say anything about uh, what the study was to the testers. Okay, now, um, and all of them dressed casually. Uh, this is just the driver characteristics. Just one thing to point out is, if you've ever taken a cab in England, you will notice that the majority of the cab drivers comes from South Asia, okay? And so that's the same for our uh, population of drivers that we happen to get at the taxi rank. Uh, the second largest one are clearly the white drivers, there are very few black uh, drivers uh, out there, okay? Um, now just the characteristics in terms of, I think I have to hurry up, uh, just want to point out, if you think that it always rains in England, it doesn't, at least not in the summer, so that was the, um, and here are our treatments, so we have twice as many short ones because they cost, we did the balancing on the budget, uh, they cost twice as much, and um, maybe just for, what was interesting is that when we when we finished the study, we were actually really surprised. So we do find what we call other regarding behavior. But let's just, uh, one step back before I show you the result, that actually we can do much more. We can see how good our calibration was. Because it's not just that they are taken for a certain amount, whatever, uh, longer, but a lot of them actually completed the journeys. And now if we just look at the completed journeys that actually were taken to the final destination, uh, we find that what the expected fare was, what we had calculated of 540, actually ended up as 544. And 10, roughly the same. So it means that, I, well, several things. It's either the British cab drivers are really honest. They take them for, they don't take them for rides. If you're familiar with any other taxi uh, publications that usually look at uh, the difference in terms of journey routes that people are taking, these were probably thought of as natives and they were taking a straight way. But uh, our calibration was, was quite spot on. Now, here are the results. And I apologize, it's a bit small, but now I can, this is great, I never got to use this, so that's, that's, let's, let's do this. So what do we have? Uh, because the laser pointer, it just wiggles around. Um, I'll show you basically a bit of a, a, a histogram or frequency of um, this, the top one, you see the short distance journeys, the bottom one has the long distance journeys. And blue is baseline, red is the business card. When you see a zero here, it means that the person, so anybody who shows up here, was basically let out of the taxi at the time for the money that they could afford. If there is left to the zero, these are people that were basically thrown out of the taxi before they even got to the amount that they could afford, right? Anybody to the right was taken for more for longer than they could actually afford. So the taxi drove on and on and gave them something for free. Now, you might think, well, maybe if we take anything around this, there, there might be some time uh, costly to find a way, suitable way to stop, right? So even if you are kind of generous and say, nah, this isn't really other regarding, this might just be an artifact of where to stop, there's a lot, right? In each one of those, where these, our drivers are actually being taken longer. So there's a lot of other regarding behavior that we find in the market. Now let's, let's look a little bit more at that. Um, if you look at uh, the average giving, so clearly what, what's interesting is that there is seemingly, there's more in the long distance. What was interesting to us is that 
actually, if you look at it percentage-wise of the expected fare, it's about the same. And that's the reason why uh, we look at, uh, initially when we designed the experiment, if I just shown you one distance and I shown you, oh, we find our taxi drivers tend to exhibit other regarding behavior, you might have thought, okay, that's fine, they do this and give a little bit and that's <coughs> it. But I show you that it depends on how much they potentially could give. So there seems to be pretty well defined relative, in relative terms that they give a little bit in the short ones and they give uh, proportionally more in the long ones. So there, it, it's much stronger evidence for this other regarding uh, behavior to be out there. Now, the proportion of completed journeys also is roughly the same. What's interesting also is to see when you look at the business card, they aren't necessarily, um, so given the business card, or not, I, I'd be careful not given, being asked for a business card doesn't necessarily seem to do anything in this market that we think is actually predominantly one shot. Now, the one thing that we observe is the ones, the drivers who give a business card, they actually tend to give, go for longer and complete more often. So, that would, might, might mean that actually you could potentially induce reputation in this market, but actually only 45% of the drivers, when asked, give a business card. So not even all of them give the business card, but the ones that do in the business card treatment, those ones tend to take people longer, which you might then think of there's some reputational concerns that they have, and they realize that, therefore they go on for longer. Okay, I am a bit conscious of time. You can't really see the numbers, but I just want to show you what, you, what we've done. Uh, some random effects, Tobit's regressions in terms of, um, on the left-hand side, you just see the amount given. Clearly, there's more given in the long-distance treatment. Interestingly, when we look at percentage of expected fares, I told you, there's no difference between these two um, uh, treatments. But this is our first attempt to look at the ethnicity of our tester, of the passenger. And what you can see here is that our black testers uh, tend to not be taken longer, right? They do not uh, seem to be the recipients of this other regarding behavior. And for the male, which are surprisingly many of you in the audience, uh, that's also not very, uh, you're not being taken much longer. So the, the, the females got taken a little bit longer in our study. Okay, um, there must be something positive, right? Uh, so this is just from the, from the first one, but I want to show you that we actually, what we do also is, um, I'll, I'll skip that because I want to just show you a little bit more. We're going to dive a bit more into this ethnicity and we also match the ethnicities of the tester with the ethnicity of the driver, okay? And um, this is still not the driver, but just in terms of the, the tester, if you look at the proportion of journeys completed, clearly our... Uh, the, the black testers have a fewer proportion of journeys completed and that's in both of these uh, regardless of baseline or business card. Now here you might think this is a bit odd that our South Asian uh, testers uh, get a bit, there's quite a seeming difference here. Um, there's the caveat, while the majority of the drivers are South Asian, we couldn't get very many of our testers uh, that are South Asian. We have very few of our testers to be South Asian. We have a feeling uh, what's happening here is that if you are from a particular kind of closer or, or similar ethnicity and you ask the driver, oh, I'm looking for a reliable driver, can I have a business card? The driver might think, I know what you're up to, you just want something from me, so therefore I'm not going to give it to you. So this is in some sense the backfiring here, but this is just casual, we don't have enough data to really say that this is what's going on. But what we do is... Um, uh, actually look at the structural model. You might like them or not. I think they are quite useful to, to kind of bring it back to behavioral theory and see now, okay, so what if we do assume that we have a utility function of our drivers that are group contingent? And so we can now look at, we have the ethnicity so far, all the results were without the driver's ethnicity. They were just based on the testers' ethnicity and looking at the general population. Now we are looking at the driver's ethnicity and we're looking at the tester's ethnicity, okay? And now what we do is we take three, you might think of them as rather popular utility formulations that are out there. Um, some of them are more flexible than others, so we estimate them all, basically. 
And um, so the clearly Fair and Schmidt for anybody, this is a very um, uh, predominantly used formulation for social preferences. So, so we have to kind of put that in the mix. And the others, basically Cox et al., they are very flexible, as you can see, basically, these two models coming from, from this one paper. And um, here's what we assume. The driver's payoff is M, uh, and that's what? It's basically the amount that the tester pays. Uh, we look at what the driver gives to the tester, which is the giving, right? Um, then, remember, they are owning their cabs, uh, their, their, their cabs, and they have to be responsible for the fuel costs. We can look at the distance traveled, uh, and we multiply that by the price of petrol. We know what the predominantly used model of these Hagney carriages is, and we look at the fuel consumption, we have the traffic intensity, so we look at the, um, how much it costs in particular traffic situations to be driving, uh, and we put that into the uh, regression. And then the passenger payoff is X, basically, which is the amount given by the driver. And so we estimate that. Uh, and here's what it looked like. Basically, our theta, which is now our, um, the kind of uh, parameter that we're interested in, depends on the driver's and tester's ethnicity. You will see that we actually, at this point, we don't look at the black drivers because we have so very, many, so very few of them that we uh, don't include them. So we only look at the white drivers and the South Asian drivers. And uh, we do that pretty standardly. Uh, maximate, uh, maximate, estimate that by maximum likelihood. And here's what we get. Uh, ignore the left part, also for time. This is just the model without identity. On the right one, we have the model with identity. And um, here's what you should pay attention to in some sense. This is a driver-passenger interaction. So our white-white interaction is our benchmark. So a white driver with a white passenger. And compared to a white-white interaction, how does a white-black interaction, for example, fare? Uh, fare? And uh, when you see model one, two, three, this refers to our utility formulations that I'd shown you earlier. Now you see that the white-black one, it is negative. It does show up only as significant in the first utility formulation. Um, but when you come, when you see now, when you look at the South Asian drivers, they clearly are, um, compared to the white-white interaction, South Asian drivers give white passengers less than what white drivers would give white drivers. Okay? But now when it comes from South Asian towards black, that's really where a lot of the action is. So they are the ones that are not taking our black testers uh, for, for a longer distance. Okay, and um, if you were to put that into your intermediate micro for your students and you try and do kind of indifference curves, so this is basically, this is the, uh, remember, this is the taxi uh, driver's payoff, this is the passenger payoff, so always think of if we were in a model totally near class standard, only my own utility matters, anything up here is better, right, we want to be yet up there. But if this was the budget constraint, so here this is a, the baseline, so the white-white interaction, say. So a little, a lot more to the driver, clearly, but quite a little bit to the tester. So the fact that you give something to somebody else, already there's this other regarding. Now, the, the more you move away from the white-white interaction, you get more to the driver, so the driver's behaving less other regardingly, so much more self-interested, self okay? And um, then when it comes to clearly the South Asian uh, black interaction, which is this one, where you never try and tell your students that this is what indifference curves look like, but uh, there's pretty much, it's no giving to, to, the, to the other side. Okay? So, um, basically what I hope I've uh, convinced you a little bit is that we can even as lab experimentalists, remember we're setting out really as lab experimentalists trying to defend what we find in the lab and see can we observe this in the field. And we do find quite strong evidence that if you look at it combinedly, we have about 75% of our drivers give at least something and some quite a lot to the testers, to our passengers, right? And um, you might think, well, Brit, it's a very... It's a very stylized market, a very special market also, because while it's in its aggregate, it's a very thick market, ultimately the interaction comes down to a one-on-one. -on -one. It, it's, it's a negotiation, a bargaining between one party and the other. That's right. 
But I believe that there are many other markets that are out there where you find that similar same last bit one on one. Okay, and those are the markets where these things matter. In a centralized market that's probably computerized, well, we might not find other regarding behavior because there's no room. But there are other markets that are there where there's plenty of room for these other regarding behaviors to be affecting the outcomes. And um, clearly, if any of you want to collect some more data and do other settings, I'd be more than happy to see that because I think that we need some more um, evidence for, for anything that I presented to you today. So thank you very much. Thank you.